Hey, how's it going? This is Pat Finnerty. You're listening to The Vinyl Guide. Um, Eddie Trunk isn't, because Eddie Trunk doesn't like vinyl. And the reason why I know that is that I listen to the Eddie Trunk show on Sirius XM every day. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. This episode is brought to you by Groove Washer, the best record cleaners and protective sleeves for your vinyl collection. Ask for the Groove Washer from your local shop or go to GrooveWasher.com. Discount code VINYLGUIDE10. And now, on with the show. Welcome to The Vinyl Guide, the podcast for record collectors and music nerds. Here's your host, the biggest record nerd of them all, Nate Goyer. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Episode 431, and I think you're going to really enjoy this episode, folks. Just a bit of perspective. Last week, we had on the show, episode 430, Mr. Rick Beato. And Rick is a music commentator, a YouTuber. I mean, he's got 5 billion subscribers who follow his videos. And Rick regularly breaks down songs on his YouTube channel, uh, popular songs, into their core elements and explains what's happening in a series he calls What Makes This Song Great. So in a fortunate slash bizarre yin-yang turn of events, that only this universe can provide. We have on the show this week, Mr. Pat Finnerty, who has a YouTube channel. He's a music commentator as well. His series breaks down songs that are annoying or that he thinks stinks. And of course, his series is called What Makes This Song Stink? And they're absolutely hilarious videos. If you haven't seen Pat's videos, pause this podcast and uh, check some of them out. What Makes This Song Stink? Number six with Danny California, or number eight with Jason Aldean. Those are amongst my favorites, but I think they're all funny. And Pat really knows his stuff. I mean, he's a very talented musician. There's several videos of him on YouTube just playing, and he's very, very good. He's also very knowledgeable on music theory, and he explains it in a hilarious way that makes it very compelling to watch. I could easily lose a couple of hours going down the Pat Finnerty YouTube rabbit hole. So again, I think everyone's in for a real treat. Pat Finnerty of What Makes This Song Stink is our guest this week on The Vinyl Guide. Oh, and by the way, if you enjoy this chat with Pat, there's an extra 30 minutes-ish available only to our Patreon legends. Patreon.com slash Vinyl Guide. You head up there now, help support this show, help your buddy Nate, and of course you get all sorts of extras like extended interviews, commercial-free episodes, high resolution files and a lot more. So again, there's a whole another section of this conversation only available at patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Head up there now and enjoy. And finally, if you're new to the vinyl guide podcast, we welcome you with open arms. We've got over 400 other episodes and interviews available to enjoy anytime, including YouTube music juggernaut Rick Beato talking analog AI and the future of music, episode 430. Justin Chancellor of Tool, episode 417. Comedian, actor, and podcast pioneer Mark Marin, episode 400. Jason Bonham talks about his father and playing with Led Zeppelin, episode 383. Tom Schultz of Boston, episodes 297 and 298. Billy Gibbons of the Mighty ZZ Top, episode 293. Fred Armisen of Portlandia and Saturday Night Live Talks Records, episode 289, and literally hundreds more. Follow The Vinyl Guide in your podcast app. There's no paywall. It's all free to enjoy anytime. And with that, let's begin our conversation with Pat Finnerty, creator of What Makes This Song Stink. Pat, thank you so much for making the time, mate. Uh, hey. And uh, pretty busy season for you, I guess. This last "What Makes This Song Stink" is seemed to have uh, rocketed right off. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like I, I say this a lot, where I feel like what I do is uh, like into the deadliest catch. Have you ever watched that program? I I'm familiar with the concept, but tell me how it interlinks. Fishermen go out for like three months and like catch king crab in Dutch Harbor. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's usually five rival boats going after the crab but these fishermen make all their money in in a matter of like three months so like for me i i take three to four months making a big video and then i just kind of like go on instagram live and go on podcasts and stuff like that after 
you don't see me for like months. People are like, is he dead? And I'm like, no, I'm just trying to find pictures of Jason Aldean eating pizza so that I can <laughs> Photoshop him. <laughs> so uh, th this is the period where, okay, the, uh, you, you're now surfing the wave. Is that yes. uh, okay? The reaction to it has been quite remarkable. Let me, let me ask you with, with your series, what makes a song stink? Have you ever heard back from any of the artists? Not one. Not one. Okay. Not one. I, I feel like there's only, I, I suspect that it's got to three doors down. And the only reason why I say that is because, well, there's a couple of things. One, three doors down is the only one. If you go to the comments under that video, it was the first one that I did. I feel like their family members are in the comments because <laughs> the way that they're coming at me, like they're, they're angry. They're, <laughs> those are the angriest comments of all. Of uh, the three doors down folk. And then someone sent me um, a gig. You're in Australia, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Someone sent me a Red Hot Chili Peppers show video from a show where Chad Smith had a uh, vest on that said Big Cat on it. Um, oh. And I call him Big Cat in, in, the, in the Red Hot Chili Peppers episode that I did. Mm -hmm. That would be amazing. But I was also made aware of old school where uh, Will Ferrell, who looks exactly like Chad Smith, is referred to as Big Cat. Now, I forgot about that completely. I saw old school once. No, nothing against old school. I'm mm -hmm. sure I enjoyed it when I watched it, but I did not remember that. So that's like a parallel thinking. So uh, maybe, maybe somebody in the Red Hot Chili Pepper camp. Possibly. Got it. But I've never heard from anyone. He could potentially use a, a, a bald as shit cap. I mean, he's always wearing the, 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 the baseball hat, yeah? No, he's not bald. He's just always wearing a baseball hat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. I would I would absolutely I would send him one. I would I would these are the ones that the one that I have on right now <laughs> um has the uh, uh like just adjustable strap in the back. But I would make a signature Chad Smith model fitted because he only wears fitted backwards hats. Right. And I would even put like the MLB major league baseball thing, like except <laughs> it would be like ML Balt. Like I'd put that in the back for him. I would do that. Absolutely. I like Chad Smith. I, I don't, I've got no problems with Chad Smith. Yeah. They were actually just playing in Australia and their concert was really panned here. I don't know if that news made it back, but uh, all they yeah, did was well, play new stuff, which nobody was interested in hearing. Yeah. No, the, the, the news from them, <laughs> the news from their bad concert in Australia didn't make it here because they're just talking about their bad concerts here. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but nothing but love. Nothing but love. Here's the thing. Tony Kiedis stinks. And and it's like, but he's, like I said in my video, he's Tony Kiedis. Mm -hmm. And that band would not be what they are without him saying like, you know, I'm not my lovely man. But he just can't hit the man note in My Lovely Man, even though I love My Lovely Man. It's a good song. Mm. So when it comes to thinking of songs that stink have, have have you come upon any i don't know <laughs> a unified theory like why what makes songs stink or at least major reasons is it songwriting laziness is it repetitiveness what, what are some of your thoughts on that i think it's like everybody that writes songs knows that there are moves that you can take that um might be a shortcut or something like that where it's just like when you think of the great bands and you think of all of the great artists that we've have in our life, when you think of David Bowie and you think about like the people that he's working with and it's just like, you listen to Lodger. I mean, that thing is, can you curse on this of course. podcast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That thing is so fucked up, right? It's one of my favorite Bowie records. And it's just like, you think of how much you could push and pull these notes that we have in interesting ways. And when you can make a pop song out of that is, I think, the most exciting thing in all of music where you could be like, holy shit, they just did that? I mean, that's what the Beatles taught us. I always say this, like the Beatles fucked us in the end because they said like, hey, um, we started at I Want to Hold Your Hand and now listen to She's So Heavy, right? So it's just kind of like you could do all of this stuff, but it's out there and that's what my ear wants because as a young kid that I was listening to the Beatles and I'm like, this is amazing. And then you hear like, I'm here without you, baby. You hear some bullshit repetitive stuff that just uses the same old cliches and the same old tropes. It, it And then it becomes popular. That's where I come in. Um, if your band stinks and nobody knows about it, that's fine. But if it's like a number one hit and I have to hear it everywhere I go, that's when I might, uh, you know, call up the troops 
and uh, <laughs> you know, have to do some research on it. And that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I kind of feel about it. Yeah, because I, I tend to think, now I'm, I'm not a musician. And I, I, I tried, I thought I was at one point, I was horrible. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more yeah. of an engineer, nerd, yeah. nerd type, right? But when it comes to music, I like to be challenged. And that's mm -hmm. where I, I like the unexpected, like Bowie. Or like mm -hmm. some of these chord changes, like, oh, that's just taken me somewhere I didn't expect it to go. Yeah. And it seems like the songs that stink, right? You know, they, mm -hmm. they seem to be very predictable. But I think here's the problem. I think the vast majority of human beings like the predictability. Mm -hmm. I, I think they savor that. I think change confronts them. It's, it's almost like an instinctual thing to where, you know, the ancestors, you know, anything different was a danger. Yeah. And so I think they like that predictability. So you take something like Jason Aldean, you, you know, the song's kind of go, it's building, you know where the peak is going to be, you know where the chords are going to be, you know there's going to be extra harmonies at the end. There's a, it's almost like a paint by numbers at that point. Mm -hmm. Th that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. But maybe that's just me and I'm being an elitist music nerd. Well, you are. And, and so am I. I mean, and that's kind of what we are, <laughs> you know, and that's why when when Three Doors Down fans get mad at me, I don't care. People are always like, do you do you get upset when people I'm like, no, because at the end of the day, they, they like Three Doors Down. And and as long <laughs> as they're not hurting people, I don't care. The reason why I do the reason why I had to do the video on Jason Aldean is because I think that that promotes racism. I don't, it, you can go into a court of law and he could say that it never said anything, right? But we all know. And if you're able to put your name on that, and then you're able to defend that when I just think that it puts out uh, uh, dangerous thinking and the song stinks and the song stinks, that's when I'm like, okay, I'm going to dedicate months of my time into this. And, uh, but if it was just like a bad song, that's why something always connects for me where I've like kid rock. What a piece of shit, you know, like Beverly Hills, that song stinks, you know, like there's, I have to feel it in, in me. It's either like, you gotta be a bad guy or you're really letting me down. That's, that's kind of how I, I pick the songs uh, that I do, but to say like, of course we're known as like elitist, but I feel like you, you know, the vinyl guide and with all the records behind you and you, and how many episodes have you done? Jesus. Uh, four thirty something. Four thirty. Yeah. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, Jesus. So you're talking about vinyl, but here's the thing about vinyl. It has a warmth to it, right? And that's like a really hard thing to define. And I and I was thinking about that the other day where I was just like, what turns me on as far as music goes is finding that warmth and and vinyl when you listen to something on vinyl it has a warmth to it and that's the music that i'm attracted to the and it goes back to the analog stuff analog versus digital um and and it's really hard to quantify but like maybe that's why i can't get into early metallica records because it just sounds hot you know like those those solid state amps and all that shit I like warmth, you know, and that's kind of uh, hard to define, but that's where I think that uh, elitists, like, you know, we would be called snobs or whatever. That's kind of what we're chasing after. Wouldn't you agree? I think so. I, I always find like I, I have a limited amount of time and the older I get, the more I become aware that all these records, I'm probably not going to have time to listen to them all in depth, you mm -hmm. know, and yeah. so I have to be very choosy about how I spend my time. So I'm out for particular music and I, and I have, I suffer no fools at this point. If there's something yeah. that if there's, if I start an album and by song two, I'm not getting into it, I'm taking it off and I'm, I'm going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's being a snob, but I, I you know, I, it's, it's like a bad movie or a bad book. Don't be afraid to shut it. If it's not taking you where you want to go. Yeah. I mean, there's stuff that you said challenge before and there's stuff that i feel like i okay i need to really sit down like right now i've never really spent a ton of time with genesis like peter gabriel genesis right. i love peter gabriel i've never i'm just i'm i'm practicing patience and i'm and i'm really going through the first couple of genesis records like in in earnest i'm really like because i'm not a prog fuck but I love some prog. Mm -hmm. And so now I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm like, I could be listening to something that is much more accessible to me, but I want to get this. So I've decided that this week is my Genesis week. 
and that's how I'm doing it. So I get in the car, Genesis. I'm 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 working around the house, Genesis. And there's songs that I've I remember I heard when I was like teenager twenties that are coming back. And there's new ones that I'm hearing from me that I'm getting into. And there's other ones that I'm like, this is fucking bullshit. This is just throwing too much in for too much, you know. But that's that's kind of how I'm dealing with it right now. You Genesis may, yeah. week. You, yeah, you may exit. Well, you definitely will exit this week with definite opinions and whether you're going to go back. And I, I, I had the same sort of thing with with Big Star. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm going to dedicate several days to Big Star. I need to. Under, and I think I don't know how old you are. What year were you born? No, I'll just tell you how old I am. Oh, okay. 43. 43. OK. All right. So I'm, I got a decade on you. I'm 50. Something. OK. Putting something like Big Star in context is very difficult these days. Because you have all this pop uh, that has occurred since then, and mm -hmm. not to to not appreciate like what they were at the time, probably right. Genesis too. You know, we've heard so much prog. It's like you, you go back to what was happening in the early seventies. It was pretty revolutionary at the time. Now, maybe not so special in in context of everything. So, to be able to put yourself in that seat and say, okay. Let me truly kind of drink this in. What can I learn from this? I, I absolutely do that as well, like going on on different tears of an artist just to just to see what I could learn, see what I'm missing, see what the fuss is about. Yeah, I mean, Big Star is a great example. I mean, because God knows, I mean, Jesus Christ, Big Star may as well put them on the fucking cross. I mean, how many Big Star <laughs> conversations that I've been in in my entire life? And I like Big Star, don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. Uh, but they had like, nobody gave a shit about them then. You know, Alex Chilton, he's he's like revered. I mean, he's like almost like a uh, like a weird mystical creature at this point. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul Westerberg writes a song about him and he's like writes September Girls, which is one of the best pop songs ever written. But then he goes on this weird 70s trajectory of like like flies on Sherbert. I don't know if you heard that record. Like he gets crazy. But Big Star, what, two records? Three, three, um, three. If you three, three. If you stretch it, but it's it's really yeah. like that one. You know what I mean? And with Chris Bell, Chris Bell, with Chris, yeah. yeah. And they're great. They are. I have friends that would probably put them above the Beatles. I would not. I think that Big Star is great. I do also think they have some snoozers. But like Life is White, uh, I think that's my that's my favorite one. Uh -oh. But they're great and they're unsung and they had their you know, year. So like, if you hadn't listened to them, but you've God knows how many people are, you see that fucking star t-shirt everywhere you <laughs> yeah. go, you know, and you know, Tweety loves them and you know, like, and you're just thinking about all you gotta love. Them. You gotta love big star. And I do, but it's just like, they're, they're one of those bands. I felt like an imposter, like not yeah. truly understanding Big Star for quite some time. And I've had them yeah. on in the background, but I never kind of went into them. Who in your mind is an, a near flawless artist? Uh, I mean, I'm a huge Tom Petty guy, mm -hmm. but he's got some stinkers. He's, I mean, have you heard The Last DJ? It's pretty rough. <laughs> My name's Joe. I'm a CEO. Joe's tough. I love Tom Petty so much. And I feel like he, there are always great songs on the, uh, on the, on the, there's, there's always a couple that are really great on the final, a couple of Heartbreakers records. But I thought the Mud Crutch records, the last two Mud Crutch records were amazing. Like I, I, there's songs on that, that I would put up there with, you know, wildflowers ish kind of stuff. So I feel like he still had a pretty good, relationship with the muse or with whatever it is and him and Campbell together. Mm -hmm. I just feel like they never gave up, you know, they never stopped trying to come up with cool tones and cool mm -hmm. uh, arrangements and, and shit like that. So I'd say Petty had a pretty good run because I love old Petty. I listen to more old Petty than I do young Petty more old. Oh, oh, more, more like later year. Yeah, later year. Yeah, okay. like I like them. I like them forty plus. I right. like, you know, Wildflower Echo is my favorite record. So, you know, I the wisdom he was throwing out there, and also just the fact that it, they're still rocking. And like I said, those Mud Crud records uh, are two of my favorites of his whole catalog. So mm. they're they're up there. I would say Petty is a guy, but I mean, he's got some stinkers. He's he's, he's got some stinkers. Yeah, yeah. There's. I mean, that's why I say near. <laughs> Yeah. flawless because there's always going to be those kind of weird 
diversions. I mean, most artists, even Bowie, there's a couple of albums sure. of his that are kind of like, yeah, well, I only have that because I'm <laughs> I have the whole series, but it's not going to go on very often. No, we're not putting the, you know, I'm not putting Tim Machine on. Uh, <laughs> even though maybe I'll try again. Who knows? Yeah. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, when you have so many good records, but then he, but the last record was incredible. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's just like that's mind blowing, Black Star, because I love so many of those songs. Yeah, it's he still had it, he still it was still in there. Are you a Lou Reed fan by chance? Casual, I would, I would not say that he is. If I would say that if I was college course Lou Reed, I would probably be like 200 level because I, I love the Velvet Underground Transformer. I haven't done there's a lot of holes in my, in my Lou Reed hole. And I feel like maybe it's just because what a dick, you know what I mean? (laughs) What a dick, but I almost should like him more. And it's not like everybody needs to love the Beatles, but I feel like you can't talk shit on the Beatles and he does, you know what I mean? And I'm just like, all right, Lou, you know, it's it's more about him making a statement about himself than anything else when it comes to that. Absolutely. I feel like he's the cool Don Henley in a way. You know what I mean? Where it's just like, because I, I don't know if I'd want to hang out with the guy. Would you? Oh, no, no, no. He he seems just like living his life as a clenched fist. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. He's also playing that Steinberger guitar in the 80s where that was wild. You know, no headstock on it. And it's, 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 he's wild. I feel like, not that I need to be able to hang out with whoever I, you know, but he's one of the guys where I'd just be like, all right, Lou, I'm just going to let you hang over there. I don't, I don't, I don't need to say hello to you, you know, but I've never been able to get into Lou Reed and and there's so much, I think my problem with Lou Reed is there's so much Lou Reed and it's so spotty that you almost have to have a Sherpa pointing certain things out. Mm -hmm. He's got a lot of records and a lot of highs and lows. And, And some I think is, is quite interesting, quite brilliant. Even going back to Velvet Underground, I struggled to listen to that first album because the guitars are out of tune. Yeah, they are. And in that, I don't know, I got it's not perfect pitch, but I, I get super annoyed when it's not tuned. When the right. and just hearing that it, it kind of grates on me. It distracts me from kind of getting into the song. No, I get that. I mean, but there's clams and out of tune guitars everywhere on like almost all the sixties records where it's mm-hmm. just like you know, like blonde on blonde, there's bass clams left and right. I mean, there's missed notes you know like wrong notes on blonde on blonde that will kind of piss me off in some way but then i'm just like no it kind of rules like if it was right at this point i would be like i don't know if i you know like uh visions of johanna like there's there's mm-hmm. bass fuck ups all over that song and I that's like visions of notes. johanna you know <laughs> I, I can handle bad notes. I could hit. I, I could handle that. What what right. really irritates me is the constant strumming with the G flat a little right. bit. Right. You yeah. know that. Yeah. Kinda, oh, okay. that's it's going to be like this the whole song. Right. It, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. I asked my dad this. I was like, Dad, how did you guys tune? Because my dad played in bands in the '60s, mm-hmm. and he's like, we didn't. And I'm like, so basically, he was like, if you could tune, you would get a gig. You know, because we all have tuners now. I mean, everyone, mm-hmm. there's been tuners forever. And then this this other guy who was friends with my dad told me that, he's like, I didn't hear a band in tune until 1978. <laughs> like, <laughs> so the fact that these bands like were able to tune by ear is very impressive. Like, it, mm-hmm. it's, you know, when you see live performances and stuff like that of, of, this, of this gear. But I think a, a lot of times the songs are so good that you might not necessarily hear it. But in the case of the Velvet Under, I know what you're talking about and uh, I get it because it's grating. You know? That's interesting. Cause even like, you know, Led Zeppelin, the mighty powerhouse in the seventies, they're, mm-hmm. you know, their roadies weren't handing them an, an updated tuned guitar. Every other song. No, you know, Jimmy Page, no. starts with the Les Paul. He tunes it himself and then goes for it. Yeah. Maybe it's a mid to that. tune. That's about it. And, do you, you don't play guitar, but no guitars are in tune. Zero. Mm-hmm. Like they're, they're just never in tune. It doesn't matter. You could buy a fucking $50,000 brand new Strat custom shop from Fender. They hand it to you. You play two chords and it's probably out a little bit, right? Mm. The fact that these fucking people were up on stage, no tuner and just tuning by ear, amazing. It's mm. It's really amazing because 
I have relatively good pitch. I don't have perfect pitch, but still just to get it right on because you got six strings. And if one of them is just a little bit and then you then you start chasing the other one, it's like, was it this one or was it that one? And then you're just in no man's land. I saw Neil Young on Howard once and they handed him a guitar. Howard's like, you know, Neil, will you play something? And they handed him a guitar and it was out of tune. And Neil's trying to tune the fucking thing like in the 2000s. And he just said to Howard, he's like, I haven't tuned one of these things in 30 years. He's like, I don't even know. You know, Neil can do it. So it was just like because he hadn't done it in so long, you know. So you you grew up in quite a musical house then, yeah. Your yeah. Parents were 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 musicians, so or music was important early on. It was kind mm-hmm. of a, a big record collection. A lot of like, what, what were the sort of records you had? Or I'm assuming they're records. Yeah, no, there right we had a record yeah. player, and that was how I was listening. And it was a lot of Beatles. I mean, not to keep just talking about yeah. the Beatles, but it was like a lot of Beatles and a lot of Motown. That's what I remember the most as a kid. But I had all of my mom's and my uncle's and my dad, uh, just all the Beatles records. So I just remember, okay, meet the Beatles. We did it. Then the next one, you know, with the Beatles, we did it. Beatles second album, we did it. You know, like, and I would just put it down and look at the stuff and all of that until we got a CD player. And then to make room in our living room, the the record player went to the middle room. And then to make room in the middle room, the record player went out. So then we just had uh, CDs and tape players from like 1989 on. So but when I was nine or 10, then it, it kind of switched over. But like as a kid from like six to nine, it was all just the vinyl Beatles mm-hmm. records and like Smokey Robinson and stuff like that. Now, in terms of the format, do you, do you, do you have a record player now? Do you, do you have, I mean, you probably have, wonderful memories of records but i mean yeah. do you have a collection at all does it matter no, to you that how you listen to records or i spend all of my money on this shit mm-hmm. you know what i mean and i rent and i say this all the time i still rent and my idea in the back of my head is that once i buy a house i'm going to have a room and it's going to look like the room that you're in right now where i can you know start but then i'm like how do i what am i gonna buy tusk you know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do? Do I have to buy? Never mind. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not. So I'm like, I'm so behind where I love listening to records, but I don't have, I don't have the, a connect, I don't have a collection. So I'm going to probably have to just spend a lot of money and a lot of time just buying these records because it is how I love to listen to music. I just don't have it. So like I said, now I'm making these videos. It's like, got to buy another camera. And then I, and I'm a musician, so I buy all of this gear. So I spend more time on the active stuff than the listening stuff. So no, I don't have a record player or collection. Right you now. know, the, yeah. um, if, if all this burned to the ground, yeah, it'd suck. But building a collection organically can also be quite fun. You know, starting off. Yeah. If you only have six records, you know what you're going to be. You're going to listen to something in there. If you got a right. hundred, yeah. you're like, fuck, I can get lost in it. Well, I mean, I was at an Airbnb. You ever go to a cool Airbnb? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. like you know, when they're like, listen, this is an Airbnb, but it's a cool Airbnb. Yeah. You know, like they leave a uh, they leave a Dylan record out on the, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? They they leave like a Captain Beefheart record oh, out for you. I've they're never like been to that cool, Airbnb. Oh, cool <laughs> Airbnb. Yeah. So I was in LA and I was at this uh, cool Airbnb. And I walked in, I was like, all right, here we go. Um, and but they had a record player. And yeah, I was talking about blonde on blonde before, but they had blonde on blonde out. So I just put it on and I was like, holy shit. I just listened to the whole thing all the way through, which I would never do on like to not that I wouldn't want to listen to that record again, but like, you know, where's the time like you're talking about? And when I would just put it in my, and off my phone with my AirPods and listen to it all the way through, I wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, but I did. I sat there. I listened to it. It was awesome. It sounds, it, I mean, it just sounds better. It does. Yeah. It's, 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 but it's hard to explain why, you know, and I think it's, it's, it goes back to the warmth that I was talking about. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, hopefully in the future. And thanks for letting me on, even though I don't have a, a vinyl collection. Is this, am I breaking oh. protocols? Am I, am I, uh, yeah, is this well, an illegal interview? 
<laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll send you some forms so it doesn't uh, become an issue. Um, okay. No, Pat, I've 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 watched your videos for for quite some time, uh, and I I I rewatch them. I think they're so they're very clever, and um, I, I like how you, comedy is about punching up, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you take down the people who have enough power to be able to mm-hmm. withstand that. And, and your decision to make the, the, the video series, it was a parody of Beato. You saw a gap in the market. Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts about where this would go early on? We'll be back after these messages. Well, hey there, record collectors. There's a new service available that specializes in record cleaning, restoring, sticker removal, and professional grading. VMGVinyl.com VMG Vinyl can help you make the most of your collectible records. From professional cleaning of records and sleeves, removing old price tags and store stickers, dry cleaning and rejuvenation of old shrink wrap to make it look like new, even providing you a professional play-tested third-party grade with either removal grading or encasing in plastic you have a wide range of choices at vmgvinyl.com buying a highly collectible record and you want it checked out by an expert vmg vinyl can do that too head over there now and see what vmgvinyl.com can do for you and your collection that's vmgvinyl.com the one-stop shop for professional third-party grading cleaning and record restoration that's vmgvinyl.com Oh, and hey, record nerds, don't forget to clean your records with the very best and safest record cleaner, the Groove Washer. Make your records look and sound their very best and store them with confidence using the new Groove Washer Groove Guard record sleeves. You gotta try this out. It makes a huge difference to the quality of your vinyl experience. Ask for the Groove Washer by name at your local record store and accept no substitutes. Or head over to GrooveWasher.com and use discount code VINYLGUIDE. 10. All hail the Groove Washer. That's GrooveWasher.com, discount code VINYLGUIDE10. Now we return to the program, already in progress. No limits. No excuse. And your decision to make the video series, it was a parody of Beato. You saw a gap in the market. Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts about where this would go early on? I thought it was a good idea. And I. it was during the pandemic, COVID-19. And I didn't have anything to do and I wasn't playing gigs. So I, and I was watching a lot of YouTube videos like I usually do, usually music based. And I'm just seeing all of these people just talking about tube screamers. And I'm just like, how much can you talk about a tube screamer? Do you know what a tube screamer is? Uh, I'm assuming it's some sort of guitar effect. It's a guitar effect. It's like the main, uh, it's one of the main distortions, um, from it's one of the earliest distortion pedals and a lot of people use them and but then you see all of these youtubers just talking about all of these very fractional differences between this tone and that tone and Mm -hmm. all of this stuff i'm like so much of this is bullshit but i'm also into it but so like are you kidding me talking about tube screamers for uh three thousand videos talking about a fucking uh one little tiny little chip anyway. So I saw an opportunity to just kind of like this gear obsessed world of just all of this gear. Mm -hmm. And to me, gear was never attainable. And I saw all these people just like saying, Oh, well you just need to get this and then get, get that. And should I buy this or buy that? And I'm just like, if you're really trying to teach kids, I didn't have money to buy any of this shit. And I've seen all these people with all this stuff in the back. And I'm just like, this is ridiculous. So that was an idea that I had to like kind of make fun of that, the whole YouTube uh, world. Um, gear, and but this music gear. The so gear world, is, okay, yeah. Right. So that's a big part of in the first couple of videos that I did of just like kind of making fun of the gear stuff, even though I love gear. And then uh, the Beato thing was, yeah, it was a significant moment. The first time I saw a Beato, what well, makes it sound great. I was like, who is, who's this guy? And then he's just like talking about Everlong Foo Fighters and he's isolating the bass. In, in Everlong, and I was like, this is very funny. Why is this man talking about the bass in Everlong? It's really got that great groove. I was like, this is just, I mean, this is the bass in Everlong. I mean, it's like going like this. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, okay, I'm talking about Nate Mandel here, bass in Everlong. So then, and he's doing all the air drums and everything like that. And then I was watching more and more. 
talking about all the sus chords and the intervallic stuff and all of that shit. And I just thought it was really funny, even though I did enjoy him too. I was just like, you know, I got stuff out of the Beato videos and I still do. Mm -hmm. People think that I don't like Beato. Yeah, I was, exactly. <laughs> Beato gets the pass by me. It's just, I have to, it's, it's kind of like Beato to me, he's the big, he's the big dog, you know, mm -hmm. he's the, I call it his music now. Like he actually, he, 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 he owns music. He, he runs music because all of the big boys come to him now. So it's just like, they come to him to be like, Rick, what were we playing on this? You know, to be like, <laughs> well, you were playing a sus, uh, you know, and all of that shit. So, yeah, I mean, he's, and I feel like it, there's, there's something about him that when he, when I watch him, it kind of, uh, gives me like a, a sense of this is a guy that's been through it all as far as like, you know, he was a producer, he did all that stuff and he knows all of the good stuff that I love, but he also produced shine down, you know? <laughs> And like, so I'm just like, wait a second, Rick, you're, you're talking to me about, uh, all things must pass. You're producing shine down. So there is a level of it where I, I can take a little bit and have a little bit of fun with him, obviously. Uh, yeah. but he's also been a great sport about it. I don't think anyone walks away thinking that you don't like, or even appreciate what he does. You're very good at being able to uh, speak eloquently. In fact, with Beato, you're 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 being very appreciative and pointing out some of the funny things that I think we all kind of feel, but don't absolutely say. listen. If if here's the thing, where, where I go, the the problems that I have with the Beatos of YouTube, and the reason why I do the parodies that I do, it's because of the tropes of the the ponder mm -hmm. face, and he does that. <laughs> yeah. He's pondering it left and right. He's got he's holding that chin. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, they're all doing it. They're all holding that chin. And it's yeah. just kind of like, you know, all of the thumbnails and all of that kind of stuff is this stuff. It's not the, it's not what he's doing. It's, it's not like, you know, when he's talking, most of the, what makes this sound great. So I would, I would agree with, um, mm -hmm. right. So it's not that it's, it's, it's kind of like the presentation and, you know, seriously talking about the bass part of Everlong. I mean, that's funny. <laughs> like, so, I mean, I can't, I can't get a pass on that. Nate, Ma Nate Mandel shines in certain areas, but not on Everlong. <laughs> not on Everlong. No. And I think Nate would agree. Um, so it's just like that great thumping, you know, I'm just like, I don't know about that, Rick. But so like, there's all those things that I'll, con that I'll see and, you know, all the amps in the back and shit like that. And like, look at all this stuff, but I have stuff in the back too. So I'm kind of like full of shit in some sort of way, but. There is an element of it that I do enjoy, um, <laughs> that I do enjoy taking a little bit of, uh, you know, having a little bit of fun. Well, one thing about like someone like Weird Al, Weird sure. Al was always really good at creating this parody right uh, hot on the heels of a popular song. So while the song is still in the consciousness, he comes out with a parody of it, which kind of almost extends it. And mm -hmm. that's really hard to do because he'd always, it'd always be part of an album package. So he'd have to have eight or nine songs ready waiting for that one perfect parody. And once it drops, the whole machine kind of took off with that one parody song. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, I never thought about it that way, but yeah. Yeah. That was kind of the, the, the playbook, you know, get ready. And then once gangsters paradise comes on, then we're okay. Now we got one. Let's, you know, right. Let, let's ride that wave. But that's increasingly hard to do, especially now when hits are, two weeks maybe you don't really yeah. have time to be able to do it so jason aldean i think that was probably well maybe some of your little stinkers uh, monster truck but jason yeah. aldean was probably the one where it was closest to the song and the hype that the song had is yeah. it important to have that short time window between those i don't i don't do it too often like that's kind of and i was even worried like I started making that video when everybody was talking about it and I thought it was just going to be a little stinker. The little stinkers are kind of the closest to the actual release date of a mm -hmm. song. So it's like, I think the Walker Hayes Applebee's song I, that was out, that was happening while I did it. And I think that the monster truck, so the little stinkers are kind of like the new song reaction from me. This one started like that. And then I was just like, wait a second, this is way bigger than a little stinker. And, and I was, cause then I heard the song. 
I was just like, the, like the video <laughs> itself would have got a little stinker, but then I listened to the song and I was like, that's beat it. Uh, that is, um, this is a low vocal, slow song. This is a Def Leppard chorus. This is a chopstick sounding verse. This is, um, a Stone Temple Pilots slash Foo Fighters intro. This is, this is a terrible song and it's number one for the reason why, because it, you know, proud boy would like it. Out, and then I was like, wait, who's going to care about this song four months later? You know, it's the zeitgeist and then four months later. And I had all these thoughts as I was making the video, but I was just like, I want this to be out there. I want Jason L. Dean to see this video at some point. I want this just to be here. So I've used it as a way to tell a story of what happened in July and then, you know, and then got a current to when I put it out. So that it wasn't just like, and so many people had done videos on it, but nobody talked about the song. So I, I figured I needed to do it, but I don't think about things as far as like, what's going to bring in my number one, my metrics. People say to me all the time, they're like, you know, the Danny California video, you should do more songs like that because it'll more people. I'm like, I only can do a video that I feel like is yeah. in my heart to do. And that's kind of another reason why, like, I'll make fun of the ponder faces and the analytic kind of stuff of like chasing views or chase whatever it is it's kind of sorry kim is kind of like what i i can't do you know i i just can only do the, the way that I, I can do it it probably isn't to benefit i could probably have more subscribers if i put stuff out on a regular basis and all that shit it's just i can only do do it the way that i can do it makes perfect sense and and, and i think people see that authenticity in there as well the don't click on the link below and you mm -hmm. know, almost being the anti YouTube guy. Yeah. To a fault. Uh, well, you know, but do you, but yeah. you, you gotta, you gotta look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know, what kind of, what, what do I want to be? Yeah. There are people who, you know, have, I, I've been pitched multiple people to come on the show and I'm like, you know, that is a great guest. That was a great celebrity, but I don't really have anything to talk to him about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm no. And my wife will be like, well, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Well, yeah. No, it's, I'm, it's going to feel wrong. And it's going to feel wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had similar situations where I could talk to people or I could do certain things and it just, it, it just doesn't feel right. And I, sometimes I, I'll go back to an onion article that was about Fugazi and it was just like Fugazi has meeting and says, if we just increase our ticket prices to $10, we won't need roommates when, what, by the time we're 58. <laughs> Like, because their shows were all $5 forever. Yeah. So, like, the yeah. joke is, like, can we move it up to 8 bucks so that we don't have fucking four roommates when we're 60? Um, and I kind of feel like that's why, for me, like, everything is kind of hard to do. But it, but you do have to say, inevitably, inevitably, I will say, hey, there is a link. But, you know, um, I don't tell people to subscribe. I don't tell people to hit the bell. I can't. I don't say the C word content. <laughs> I can't do it. You know, these are just things that I can't do. Um, and it's probably <laughs> hitting the bottom line pretty hard. But I've got great people at uh, Patreon who said that, that support the channel. And, you know, that's just kind of how it goes. Yeah. And you got a great audience who, who uh, follows you and will, will help, you buy, help you buy guitars. Amazing uh, audience. <laughs> I saw what incredible. happened. The three doors down guitar. I mean, that yeah, whole scenario yeah, happened within about four hours or something it's in the mail right now yeah this guy just <laughs> sent it to me from minnesota adam we raised the money in like 20 minutes and did the deal with some teenager in minnesota now we have a three doors down signed epiphone coming our way and i'm going to be using it in the videos uh wonder if that one will stay in tune no no <laughs> An Epiphone, <laughs> the Gibsons don't stay in tune. An Epiphone signed by Brad Arnold. This thing is gonna be. This thing's gonna be a piece of shit. I can't wait to play it. <laughs> yeah, you almost want to have like a like a race. Which one will go out of tune quicker, that or the train guitar? Oh, definitely the definitely the Kryptonite guitar. Kryptonite like I feel like, yeah, I feel like that it's gonna make the Hazel Squire sound like a you know a a brand new like custom shop because <laughs> Fenders are built to sustain tune more than a Gibson. You know, if you want to get into some YouTube jargon shit, Gibsons have an, <laughs> an angle on their headstock, which is it, whatever. But they, they're not built to stay in tune as well as a Fender. So you've got a few other what makes a song stinks in the queue. You, 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 you're thinking about kind of what's next. Do you, do you have a list of, you know, a few to choose from at the moment? I have a stink tank. And I put stuff in there and, 
I have an idea for what's what makes this song stink nine. But to be honest with you, this one was so I worked so hard on this that I needed to this one was like four months of just a, it's an hour. I mean, the amount of editing is just insane. Um, mm. And it's what I love to do, but it's like the, that's why the, what makes this song stinks that I've kind of built into these behemoths. They're few and far between because of the amount of work and I do everything, you know? So it's just kind of like uh, they take a long time. So I'm probably going to put out another, I'm, I've, I'm working on a little observations video right now. They're my tiny little ones that, uh, I started, I did, I've only done one, but I'm, I'm going to be putting one of those out pretty soon. And then I'll probably do a little stinker and then there'll be another, what makes the song stink. Hopefully I hate to say it, but maybe the summer, something like that. So you're on like a six month cycle for these big ones. Something like that. Yeah. Cause they're just so intensive, but yeah, there's, there's little Easter eggs in the, in the last episode, I think you could guess who the next What Makes the Song Stink is going to be on, and it's going to be a tough one. Okay. I'm just talking about John Mayer. But I, I saw the John Mayer thing at the beginning, and I thought, yeah, yeah okay, he's he's got to come up come up at some point. Do you, do you start with the entire concept from beginning to end before you start filming, or do you start filming and kind of riffing and find your way through where, where the video is going to go? Yeah, it's almost like you hear Larry David talk about Curb Your Enthusiasm episodes where it's like he has a start and a finish and then just kind of fills it in as it goes. I feel like that's kind of how I do it, where I try to come up with the ending first, and then okay. how am I going to do that, and then how do I get there, right? So it's just like, I don't know where I started turning into this <laughs> pseudo filmmaker that I am, but I now I like an arc. I like a story. Because they've happened organically. You know, the Weezer video that I did, I, I wrote it, but it was as it was going. I was like, oh, okay, I can put these, I can tie these things. I like tying things together, you know? Yeah. So it's just like, and if I'm going to talk shit, that's why I didn't really like doing my podcast. Because it was just like talking shit for no reason. I like, I like punching up and I like making things ridiculous and tying things in together and not talking about the song. I love doing that. Mm -hmm. Um so a lot of my favorite parts of the videos are just like little tangent -y kind of things and meeting people along the way and all of that stuff. So for that to happen, it happens organically and I have to wait for it a lot, a, a lot of the time. So that's why it, they take a long time Okay. too, because I wasn't sure if I was going to really be able to put a hot tub in my garage. I didn't know if that could happen and I needed to see if it could. And then once I realized that I could, then I was like, okay, that's the end, you know? Cause I, I, I had other endings in mind. I, I had an ending of John Cougar Mellencamp coming back because he wrote small town and he was in the army in, in uh, the episode six, the Danny California oh, was going to yeah. bring that whole angle back of Coog with Arnoff in a B 52 bomber flying over the Maury County courthouse where the video was shot. And I was gonna, that's where I was going to have Al Dean and his band out front. And nobody was in the building, but the band was talking about how they got away with it. And it's a number one hit. And like they're letting us keep the master tapes in the Maury County Courthouse. So the song is safe. And they're all out there. And then Coog oh, at the end just flies over and just bombs the Maury County Courthouse. So the master tapes go off in flames. No one gets hurt. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, that was my first idea that I was going to do. And then I ended up just getting a hot tub. Okay. Yeah. Because I would imagine there's different layers. Like as you're developing it, you do all the editing yourself. Yeah. So you, mm -hmm. as you go through, you're like, oh, there's a space here. We could add a, well, there's there's punching up in terms of what you say, but there's also punching up like a script. Like, oh, I could add an oh, extra yeah. kind of gag here. Oh, and, God, yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it's I have so much more that hits the floor that I just can't use, but I have so many things that I shoot and so many little animations that I do that don't see the light of day. I mean, there's an animation that I have. I have Beato on a horse. I have Beato racing Adam Neely in a horse race that I cut from this one mm -hmm. because over who has the rights to 440. Now, 440 is <laughs> is commonly is the standard tuning. Yeah. So an A440 is like a standard way of, of tuning the guitar. And I said it in this in this video. So I said 440, which is very music nerd kind of thing. And I said Beato. But then I said, ooh, could be Neely. Because Adam Neely is like the little mini Beato. Like, you know, they're both trading like, you know, sus mm -hmm. chords and and like, you know, uh, diminished and half diminished and all that stuff and intervallic stuff. So I was like, ooh, is it Neely? And then I had to like, I had this crisis. I'm like, who gets this 
who gets the name set after 440. Mm -hmm. And it turned out I couldn't make the decision on my own. So I had to have them in a horse race. And uh, if you want to see that, it's on my Patreon. Who said that? And if you want to find out, if you want to find out who won. So I spent like a, a week. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not making this up a week animating. Now, when you watch it, you won't think that I did, but because my <laughs> shitty animations, but you know, all of these little things that I do, they take forever, you yeah. know, and then, and then I end up scrapping it. So I'm like, man, I just, I just animated Beato on a horse and I can't use it, you know, cause it doesn't fit in. It didn't fit in with the, with the, uh, with the video, with the narrative, mm. you know, so you got alternate endings, all sorts of different stuff, and of course, that's on your on your Patreon, which you're Who's not like encouraging that? people to do. No, no, <laughs> not at all, <laughs> not not at all. But go to your Patreon, right? I mean, Jesus Christ, 400 episodes. You talked to Mike Campbell. I did. I did. What a guy. I, I love yeah. Mike. Campbell. Who's the number one? Let, let's go to you real quick before we yeah. wrap up. I'm taking over. Who is? Who's like your? Was like holy shit! I can't believe I'm talking to this guy. Honestly, okay, so I don't get nervous that often. The one guy mm -hmm. I got nervous for, out of all the people I've talked to, mm -hmm. Dave Manichetti of Y&T. Okay. And the reason I'm not a, being. I'm not a big Y&T guy, so yeah. enlighten me. So I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Y&T were gods, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I grew up as a heavy metal kid. And these were people who, from our neighborhood, kind of made it, right? You know? Yeah. And, they were larger than life. All the local radio stations played him. He was a guy like a, ch a childhood star for me, right? So yeah. out of all the people I've talked to, he's the one guy I got nervous from because, you know, again, even you know, as a teenager, you know, young teens, 13, 14, Y&T were God. So he was huge for me. You yeah. know, you've talked to a lot of heavy people, mm -hmm. right? So it's just kind of like, for me, like Mike Campbell is one of my favorite guitar players yeah. of all time. I don't know. I mean, but he's such a music fan that, mm -hmm. you know, I listened to your episode. He, he'll talk about the kinks for an hour, right? Like you don't need to, he knows everything. So it's like, that's what I love about guys like that, where you could just talk to them about music and you're not nervous, right? Right. So that's kind of what you always have in your back pocket. Like you interview so many people though. I mean, Jesus Christ, do you know, like, are you winging these things? Are you kip winging these things? Like, <laughs> no, like I, I go in with, do your research. I do my How much research. Time do we got yeah. here? I want to know what's going on here. What's I, happened with I this come final with a, guide with a, just preparing for this. I did, you know, several hours of listening to you on other podcasts and kind of, I've already seen your video. So I would kind of knew where to begin, but you know, starting to make notes where let some me things, ask, yeah. Let me ask you this. I'm I'm afraid I'm going to start doing what I make fun of the most, which is like the same answer. I don't want to scramble eggs, you know, not I mean obviously I'm not even close like, I'm not comparing myself to Paul McCartney by any means, but how many times have you heard the scrambled egg story yeah. like yesterday, right? And I'm like, man, do I talk about Everlong, the bass part of Everlong too much? And I'm wondering like, oh man, I got to start switching up what I talk about. But that was my memory. You know what I mean? It's right. like the first time I saw, because people ask me about Beato all the time. And I'm like, the first time I saw him, he was talking about the Everlong bass line. So I was just wondering if I gave any bullshit stock answers to you, if you just heard something else that I did. See, that's not, to me, that's not you doing it. That's the interviewer asking a question that they've heard before, or they should have heard before, that they should have heard your answer for and gone a different right. way. In my, in yeah. my mind, if it's on wikipedia then I, don't ask it don't ask it yeah you go right. at least a level deeper and that's why i look at this show right, but like, as, as as a way to be able to, this is besides my kids this is probably going to be the thing that outlives me right mm -hmm. and i want it to be something that that music fans in the future can listen to and learn from i don't want to be asking the same questions over and over because they could learn that somewhere else let's 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 take different angles on these and that's why i do it exactly fucking hell of a lot of research on each episode easily two to three hours for every hour of discussion yeah and the, like you were saying earlier in this episode where you're just like time is valuable we don't have a lot of it right. and for people and i don't use the c word but as far as content goes like for people that like you that that put this thing out as much as you do that people have no idea how much time it takes of of the scheduling and then doing research so like when when do you have time to actually listen to music? You know, that's, oh, yeah. that's kind of like, and I'll, I'll say that, uh, you know, 
like Fantano. Like, how the fuck does this guy listen to all this music? You know, I'm going to ask him that at some point. I'm just going to be like, when, how, how are you listening to every fucking album? You know, mm -hmm. so it's just kind of like in that same way. Cause I was, I was listening to your episode with Doug Marsh. I love Built to Spill. And I'm like, man, you're just throwing out these Doug Marsh fucking dork questions. And then, you know, I was listening to your, 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 uh, my Campbell episode. And I was just like, all right, he knows that. And I'm like, this is, this is some, a lot of time. So just, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, the, I hope people appreciate how much time you're putting oh, into these. Things. Thank you. Also, the editing. I oh, like to sucks. be able to to get now sucks. now you're you're quite eloquent. There's not a lot of ums and ahs and pauses, but a lot of the guests I have, they'll have mm, uh, mm, you know it, a lot of those crutch words. I'll do it too. So I want to cut those I out. I do it too. But, but if if you're going to do a podcast for audio files and record nerds, you better come with it sounding really fucking good. And that's I sh you know again, this will take me two three hours to edit and to get it sounding just right. Oh yeah. Um, so. And and I say you know a lot, so watch out. <laughs> so if you can get rid of those, I'd appreciate it. Oh, People do that though. It's it's infuriating. What cuz once you get once you hear something that you're like, "Oh my god." And the ums and the whatever, and I'm sure we both do it, everybody does, but like once I key in on somebody that's saying like or even though I say you know? like all the time, once once I hear my I'm like, "Oh god." But yeah, those little edits that takes forever um there's an um right there yeah. so it's it's a uh, it's <laughs> soup to nuts these things and that's kind of what i thought the podcast was going to be an easier thing for me to do but i'm such a editing perfectionist even though i don't know what i'm doing but for what i want to do for me i was just like i can't just let this go i still need so i ended up working on the last couple of episodes harder than I would on something else. I was like, this isn't saving me time. <laughs> I'm doing mm -hmm. more editing on this thing than I thought, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> now, you, now, you're mates with Eric Slick. He's been on the yeah. show. I'd be curious okay. to see if you learned something from the podcast that you didn't already know about Eric. I did not listen to his episode, but I will. I was just talking to him on Instagram right before we did this. I was in my hot tub. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about Peter Gabriel because I'm on such a big kick right now. And he's a huge pro guy. So it, yeah, I was just talking to him. So I will, uh, I'll listen to his episode for sure. Right. All right, Pat, thank you so much for joining us here, man. Is it, hey, before we wrap up, anything you want to talk about? We haven't talked about. No, I don't give a shit. If you, if you don't know my stuff, check it out. Pat Finnery, YouTube, see what happens. You know, if you like my shit and you want to help out Patreon, if, if, if you like my shit, but you're a cheap fuck, don't worry about it. You know, or if you're struggling, don't worry about it. I want to thank you for having me on. And I hope, you know, uh, I hope we said some some stuff. We talked about vinyl enough, right? A little bit. Little bit. You, you've only been on like one or two records, right? Yeah. Toby Lehman's military applications. Yes. That might yeah. be. Is that on vinyl? Did you make that on vinyl? Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm on that. And then uh, maybe a couple bands I was in had just like a seven inch. But yeah, I'm, I haven't really even listened to myself too much on vinyl. That's got to change. I got to. Okay. Maybe I'll I'll record Hog Ride and I'll put that on vinyl <laughs> and I could listen to Hog Ride on vinyl. Thank you, Pat, for coming on the show, mate. You're welcome back anytime. Thanks for having me, and I'd love to come back. Oh man, what a what a funny dude. I really like Pat. I'm so glad to see him. You know, having the success that he is right now. Uh, if you're not already a follower of his YouTube channel, make sure you do that and support him in any way you can. And by the way, there is an extra 30 minutes or so of this interview available only to our Patreon legends, patreon.com slash vinyl guide. Head up there now, help support the show and get all the extras. And we humbly thank you for all that. And that's it for this episode of the vinyl guide. Thank you so much for tuning in. Do me a favor, please share these episodes on your social media. Put them on Facebook, tweet them out on X or whatever you call it, Instagram, whatever. Get your friends around it. Share these episodes with some of your record nerd buddies. That is always appreciated. And of course, you can leave us positive reviews, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We'll be back shortly with a brand new episode. So until we talk next time, get out there and buy some records, people. Cheers.
That's it for this episode of The Vinyl Guide. Follow The Vinyl Guide in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use and enjoy the full back catalog of episodes of The Vinyl Guide Podcast. Thanks again for listening. This is officially the end bit of the podcast. Like, we're done. If we were in a movie, this would be one of the, the credits are going up and the curtain closes. So, come on, wake up. Come on, wake up. Let's go.